All right, we'll turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. Before I read the ninth commandment, let me open us up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. Your word is truth, and, and you are truth. And you expect a people of truth. And Lord, we confess that we often do not love the truth as we ought to. We often participate in the works of darkness by, by having a light view of, of what is false and making many excuses for that. And so, Lord, we pray that you would open up your word to us by your spirit, that you would show us wonderful things from your law, and that we would love the truth more and love defending the truth of things, defending the image of God, that we would in love for neighbor and love for you speak the truth and defend the truth and come to the aid of our fellow brothers and sisters, and our neighbors, whether they're believers or not, but all in your image. We would love the truth on their behalf and for your glory, ultimately. So we pray that you would be glorified in this uh, study tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus 20, verse 16 says this, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And I'm calling this one this evening, my neighbor's true acts, intentions, and reputation. And that's just a way to summarize everything that's covered in the catechism answer. My neighbor's true acts, intents, and reputation. The ninth commandment has been on the endangered species list for a while. Postmodernism taught us that a speaker's intent is a power play, a way to manipulate others who can't perhaps speak as well as us. Words are imperialistic, abusive to those with less to say, or perhaps not as articulate. Effeminate pragmatism in the church has elevated feelings to the throne of ruling on whether someone is divisive and whether something was either said or not said at all. How do you tell? Well, it's, it's how it made me feel. Truth is, is slain on that altar. And finally, now with the advent of cancel culture this year, which has made Orwell into a prophet and Goebbels into an amateur. What was left of our neighbor's true actions and intentions and reputation has been made an enemy of the revolution. What then is left of the ninth commandment? Does anybody even know it's there anymore? Does anybody care about false witness? Well, answering from Mount Sinai, we would say that God does. God is still watching. God is still listening. God knows and God cares that our world has trashed our neighbor's actions, intentions, and reputation with words that still have meaning as far as God's concerned, whether we mean them or not. And so as we look at question 112 of the Catechism, which asks what is required in the Ninth Commandment, we see this answer, that I bear false witness against no one. Rest no one's words, in other words, tear it out of context, torture it, abuse it, angle it, shift it. That's, that's really what it means by those words. Rest no one's words. Be no backbiter or slanderer. Join in condemning no one unheard and rashly, but that I avoid on pain of God's heavy wrath all lying and deceit as being the proper works of the devil in matters of judgment and justice and in all other affairs. Love, honestly speak and confess the truth. And as far as I can, defend 
and promote my neighbor's good name. What I'm going to do with this outline is, is a little bit different in this one than I have in the previous ones. First, we'll look at that familiar idea of the moral law in the Ten Commandments. We'll see that false witness belongs to moral law, so we'll do that somewhat similarly to how we've done it before. What I'm going to do in the second session is a little different. I'm going to do a little exegesis of Deuteronomy 19, and I was kind of kicking myself. Maybe I should have just started with Deuteronomy 19, and all that is is one application of the Ninth Commandment in Israel. And I'm going to unpack that passage in the second point. Uh, so have your Bibles ready for that. Uh, but that second point is false witness is at stake wherever truth about the image is at stake. And then thirdly, false witness is not only to avoid, but to repair. In other words, there's a proactive element. We've seen that with the other commandments too. I don't just want to avoid saying something wrong about you. If I know the law commands me, the law demands all of us, that if we know the truth and it's not coming forward, then for us to not proactively say, no, stop everything. That is not what happened. That is not what she said. This is not the truth of the situation. If we don't do that, the Bible says that we are actually guilty too. We're obstructing justice, as we'll see. And so let's look at the first point first, that false witness belongs to moral law. Remember that, that the Ten Commandments were the summary of God's law that he had written on the heart of conscience, Romans 2, 14 and 15. So these are things that everybody has written on the heart. And at Mount Sinai, God just intensified that for his people in the form of the Ten Commandments. That's all we mean by moral law. False witness is a violence to the image of God. One reason it's moral law is just like the other commandments. In the second table, it's violence to the image of God. The Old Testament scholars Kyle and Delich give us a sort of mission statement of the whole Ninth Commandment, everywhere it moves in the Old Testament. They say it's to secure life and property against false accusations. You say, wait a minute, what'd they just do there? They just brought in the Sixth Commandment and the Eighth Commandment back in. I thought we were talking about the Ninth Commandment. Well, they say if you look at the texts in the Law of Moses, you will notice that it is driven toward securing life and property against false witness. What's that about? Well, concisely stated, it's this. False witness murders and steals. When you lie about someone, you're committing a kind of violence against them. And depending what kind of lie and in what context and what the sort of situation is, is going to, uh, you know, um, determine which of those other commandments you're breaking. But false witness murders and steals. It at least tries to. Say it another way, to break the ninth commandment is to violate in spirit, if not also in letter, the sixth and the eighth commandments as well. The Bible makes this connection between lying and that design, that end of other violence, as in, for example, the two false witnesses that were ordered by Jezebel that murdered Naboth and stole his vineyard for Ahab in 1 Kings 21. And so, what were the false witnesses doing? Well, they were making it easier to kill the guy and steal his property. And so false witness is brought in the service. It's a tool to commit violence, to get other things you want from that image of God. And the psalmist cries out in Psalm 27, 12, give me not up to the will of my adversaries for false witnesses have risen against me and they breathe out violence. They don't just breathe out some contrary view. They don't just throw mad face emojis at me. They're trying to kill me, David said. Now, why is this the case that violating the ninth uh, commandment commits violence in the rest? Well, it's because of what we've seen. The image of God has a very holistic stewardship from God. Uh, a matrix of covenantal agreements that God has given to each person involving other people. We're always involved with other plans and property and productivity and even our own speech, which is really just intellectual property. Not talking about government right now. Just talking about in the sense that what somebody says is an extension. This is what we talk about property. Somebody's digging and creating something and forming something. That's an extension of their personhood, that creativity. Their speech as well. If I say, you said this and you meant that, am I not talking about you? And so it's an extension 
of their person. A false witness sends a shockwave of theft and murder and dishonor through the whole fabric of that total stewardship that we have from God. It defaces the image. It distorts it. It cripples a portion of that image of God's capacities to glorify God. So you're stealing from God when you commit a false witness. One example, obvious example, it's an everyday example. If a worker is lied about, he may expect less pay or less chance of a promotion, right? Though he may be harder working and more qualified than others who will now move ahead. It wasn't just an isolated, he said this, or he's like this, or man, don't you just hate that person and so forth, but it actually stole. It actually committed a more expansive violence against that person. False witness violates the sanctity of truth. Here's the second reason it's moral law. Not only does it violate the image in a very tangible way, it lies about God. As much as the image of God is violated, another thing we've seen is that whenever the second table, commandments 5 through 10, whenever those commandments are violated, we do have to remember what the image is theologically. The image of God reflects God. The image of God is saying something about God. If I violate the image in the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth, then I'm lying in those particular ways about God. Every violation of man is what it is because of what it says about God. In this case, it's the truth of God that is at stake, as God is truth, and Christ is the truth, John 14, 6, and his spirit is the spirit of truth in John 14, 17 and 15, 26. False witness, here's the third reason it's moral law, False witness is so obviously bad that even the pagans know it. Now, they don't act like it, but here's the bad news. We don't act like it either, but the pagans know it. As we'll see, the application of what's called, I think we mentioned this before with the sixth, the lex talionis, that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, if you've heard those expressions. And people, of course, bring that up today in the modern world to say, how barbaric, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, all that stuff. But there was a reason for it, as we've seen already. But here, it's being applied to false witness, and it's another example of general equity. In other words, even if we wouldn't replicate the exact law that the law of Israel was doing in its society, we learn from it, and something about that informs how we do morality and even civil law today. If someone is lied about, so here's some wrong ways to think about it just so we can start teasing out the right way. What do we mean by this? I understand what it means if, if somebody commits murder and a life for life. That makes sense to me. But what's going on here? If someone's lied about, the same unit of truth has to be restored. And we're going to see this in the Deuteronomy 19 text. This law was universally recognized by all societies. Kyle and Delich again report that, quote, the same law existed in Egypt with reference to false accusers. We lie about somebody, something of the same is going to be extracted from that criminal. Ritterboss says about the, the, the Code of Hammurabi, the same thing. In other words, that false witnesses deserved to have come upon them what they intended for the victim. And we'll see that in Deuteronomy 19, verse 19. This is something that is written on the heart of even the Gentiles, as Romans 2, 14 and 15 says. An ancient law reflected that. And you might say, well, yeah, but what do you, how do you repay? Is it like karma? And it's not. It's actual justice. False witness belongs to moral law. In other words, natural law. And that's only to say that false witness has an objective nature. It has a shape. And this shape to false witness, in other words, when even the pagan looks at it, they know it when they see it. It abides throughout all human societies. And people everywhere have had the sense that false witness absolutely destroys society. And they understand that. All instances in the law of Moses are magnifications of the moral law. So this is the last thing I'll say about the moral law. When you go from Exodus 21.1 all the way to Deuteronomy, 
19 would be the last place it shows up, the ninth commandment shows up. Everywhere you see the ninth commandment being applied in various civil law situations, they are magnifications of the moral law. Something is happening there that God expects us to apply in every area of our lives today. Let's look especially at the laws concerning witnesses in Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. So this is the text I want you to turn to if you have your Bibles. Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. Now there are other parallel texts that are found in Exodus 20, Exodus 23, Leviticus 5, 1, and Deuteronomy 5, 20. But this is the one I want to focus on, Deuteronomy 19, 15 through 21. And in, in this text, and, and you'll see these, this show up in, in all the other ones, various elements are going to show up. And we'll draw that out in our second point, but let me read the text first. Deuteronomy 19, starting at verse 15. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Do you notice, you bring in all the commandments. This false witness thing is about all the commandments. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he meant to do to his brother. There's the lex talionis in that law. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now, there's a few noteworthy components of this command as we turn to the second point. Four that I want to really highlight here in that text. Number one, we'll notice that there's a number of witnesses. Two, an integrity of the witnesses. Three, there is a role that is given to the judge or judges. And fourth, there's the punishment. And all of these have to be understood in a very expansive way and not a superstitious and wooden way. But let's see the significance of each of these for us today. And in this we're going to see our second point that false witness is at stake wherever truth about the image is at stake. And so this is going to apply to civil courts, church courts, mommy and daddy courts, or any uh, Facebook courts. They got those? No, and that's the problem. And, and Christians have to do better at being truthful in every area of life. So, first there's a number of witnesses. The Mosaic Law addresses this by the principle of at least two witnesses. It says in verse 15 of Deuteronomy 19, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. You see that also in Numbers 35, 30 and Deuteronomy 17, 6. That principle cannot be reduced to the judicial law of the Old Covenant. As it's cited in New Testament texts, like John 8, 17, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 through 2. And Paul was being accused of something, and he appeals to that principle. And Hebrews 10, 28. Now, the point of it is not to say, oh, you only have one witness, not two, or you've got three, and what's the two versus three? That's not quite the point. Because when he says two um, or of three witnesses, even there, there's nuance suggested. Like, you have to use moral reasoning to say, I see you've got two, but I also see these two. Don't forget, by the way, in the uh, false trial against Jesus, there were multiple witnesses, but they were false witnesses. So the point of this is not to say 
whoa, they've got two and three and 20 witnesses. I guess they must be telling the truth. End of story. That's not the point. The point is, is that we need to care about witnessing the truth. Secondly, there is the integrity of the witnesses. So we dig deeper. Note that the false witness may be either the malicious witness or even the accuser. It's suggested by one commentator that the construction in the Hebrew here in this passage suggests a witness of violence or, or a witness of wrong. In other words, um, well, I don't want to say a truth terrorist because he's not telling the truth. But the point is, is that he, his whole reason for being there is to lie, to, to put this guy away, whatever it is. That's what David was pleading for in Psalm 35 as we were singing. That was happening to him. In other words, it is a witness who intended to do violence or wrong against the innocent by supporting the guilty party. He conspired to hurt this guy in the form of a lie. Conspiracy of false witness. The other thing to notice about the integrity of the witness is that the prospects for justice in the case of all the other commandments, in other words, the only hope that we have of obeying the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and securing people's life and their marriage and their property, the only way that's going to be protected depends on the true witness. The true witness in the ninth is like a dam and the raging rivers of murder and adultery and and, um, and theft are flooding and coming into the village and, and the true witness is being called by God to stop that. So does that make sense? That's, that's what the true witness and his integrity is there for. And no doubt those who commit any of the other crimes will often maintain their innocence. And just as surely the innocent will often be blamed for committing those other crimes that they didn't. But at this point, the true witness is the hinge of the whole justice system. You see what's going on here in the ninth? It's not just don't do this, don't do this, don't gossip, don't slander. It's saying, I need a hero here. And who does? The one that's being accused. Okay, so this is the hinge of the whole justice system. That's why the witnesses are cautioned against forming a faction to sabotage justice. In Exodus 23, for example, in that passage in verses one and two, he says, you shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice. It's very similar words to that proverb we read a couple weeks ago on murder. My son, do not join in. And you have this picture of this mob. And you can be such a mob in false witness. Just go on social media. Again, it just kind of looks like vultures uh, to, to, to crucify someone. And that's what Exodus 23.1 is, is saying. And that's what Deuteronomy 19 is calling for the opposite. We need some virtuous witnesses here to make sure that doesn't happen. In these passages, there's a kind of locking arms together in a cause. And, and this may have been a smaller special interest group, as we call it today. But it may also be the more natural lure of the majority what everybody's saying, what everybody's doing, what is safe to say, what you must say to keep your job. And that somehow makes it better. But it doesn't. You're guilty of that crime by going along with the crowd. Now, the third thing about this passage is the role of the judges. To appear before the Lord, as it says here. It shows us how the courtroom of God's people has a kind of priority over secular courts. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 6 in the New Testament as well, in Paul's logic there. There's a kind of higher standard and a kind of higher standing of the church courts. For now, we simply note that in Israel, there was no divorce between the secular court and the priestly court. And that is different now. But it does say in verse 17, to come before the priests and the judges who were in office in those days. So to come before the Lord was to come before his appointed representatives. You might remember that the priests were to guard, that word that was used all the way back to the first time in Genesis in the garden, to guard the holy things of God. And primarily that does refer to the sanctuary. However, the courts of justice in Israel become another kind of sanctuary. 
so that the priests were also guardians of civil justice, people who were oppressed. David uses this courtroom language everywhere in the Psalms, and Isaiah uses it. And so the courtroom, which we might think is such a wooden place and a cold place, but if you were being oppressed, it's a sanctuary. It's a safe place if the true witness judges. Classic New Testament passage on what not to do when it goes to the secular court is the example of Pilate. In Matthew 27, 24, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd. That's where we get the phrase from. I'm going to wash my hands of this, right? Washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Now, such an action falsely assumes that one can opt out of rendering justice. That's what we mean when we say, I'm washing my hands of this, go ask your mother. Or something like that in any of the courtrooms of life. It can be said of both the witnesses and the judges that their chief object is justice. That's what God made them for, and they're shirking their responsibility. If they don't do it, they're not washing their hands of it. They're not just failing to do justice, they are obstructing justice. In Exodus 23, 2, the verse ends with the infinitive in the Hebrew, which in English is just rendered to pervert justice. If you put your, 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 you know, your fingers in your ears and say, ah, I, don't, I know this is a lie and they are going to destroy that person, but I don't want to lose my job or I don't want to sound like a jerk or I don't want to do this. That is to pervert justice. It's not just to fail to do it because you're called to do it already. Neither the witnesses nor the judges are to show favoritism. They're not to present uh, themselves in the courtroom to defend their own, but to tell the truth. If they know the truth, if they know enough to find out the truth. So you say, well, I'm not sure, sure. Well, depending on where you are in relation to that case or that person, you may know enough that it is your moral obligation to find out. And if not, then we are complicit in the false witness if we do not come to the aid of the oppressed with that truth. Fourth thing about this passage and the last thing, and that is the punishment proper. Vern Poitras, in his book on the law and the shadows of Christ and the law of Moses, speaks about this ninth commandment everywhere, and he remarks about Deuteronomy 19 that no damage is actually done. And what he means by that is not to water it down. He's, he's saying, notice something here. There's actually no damage done in this particular instance, which tells us something interesting, because the words, as he had meant to do, there is a punishment. You say, well, for what? As he had meant to do. And so even when there is no material restoration, there is still punishment. So what's prescribed? Well, it says in verse 19, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. What can possibly be meant by this? You know, I thought this was eye for eye. Are God's people to lie about the person who lied about the other person? I'll be the instrument of karma. They wanted to lie about this person, and uh, we're going to lie about, well, obviously that's not what it means. That would take Gandhi's maxim that's always quoted in this context, a lie for a, uh, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. What would that mean here? And a lie for a lie makes the whole world what? Doesn't even make any sense. And so clearly that is not what is being commanded here. This particular application of the eye for eye principle only makes sense if there were real objective damages sustained to the image of God. So you say, well, they didn't loot his property. He didn't lose his job. He didn't die. He didn't go to jail. He didn't get canceled. But it only makes sense if there were real objective damages sustained to the image of God by the original lie, even if no other material resources were lost. And it only makes sense if there was a real constructive remedy for those damages. 
In other words, it implies that you actually can repay or restore or bring restitution to the image of God in some way. And so that brings us to our third point. False witness is not only to avoid, it is to repair. It is not just, like all the commandments, it's not just to avoid slander, gossip, backbiting, resting their words, telling lies in court, but to do the opposite and all the way to making it right if it already went wrong. Obedience to the ninth commandment is proactive. Notice the last words of the catechism answer. Defend and promote or advance. So you're not just defending. You're advancing. How do you, how do, you do that? How do you advance your neighbor's good name? Well, this means caring about the truth of things. What went down? Ah, that's so petty. God doesn't think so. God is under the impression that real damage to the image of God was done. Therefore, wherever that is, there has at least been that violence. It means that cancel culture isn't just a cute or even annoying thing that we can tolerate. It is a violent thing that liquidates real people through lying about them. Even if at the end of the day you say, well, they didn't have it so bad after all. What are you complaining about? That's a terrible thing to say about an image of God, that God has said that he takes this seriously. And, and when, when major church leaders and institutions, year after year after year, start joining in with the secular crowd to tear down others without a trial, whether it be a judge in Alabama, who major Christian leaders start joining in before any evidence and start calling them a kid toucher. Those Christian leaders, becomes an oxymoron at that point, need to repent for treating other people like that. Or Nick Sandman, a teenager, joining in with the crowd. Oh, he's just Catholic, he doesn't matter. Kyle Rittenhouse, the mass shooter. Institutions with the, world, with the word gospel in them, joining in with the mob. That is a violation of the ninth commandment. And by the way, these people could lose their lives for it. That is an abomination to the Lord. The only proper call to those institutions and Christian leaders is to repent and to restore that person's good name. This implies discerning attributes of false witnesses in the act of the Exodus 23 passage, when commentators suggest that 